Russia annexes Crimea, Common Core meets resistance, Nate Sir Silver's controversial hire, and the banned bossy campaign. I'm John Romero, and this is The Square Circle. Welcome to the Square Circle. I'm your host, John Romero. Joining us today are Lacey Crawford of Social Security Works, progressive activist Jason Roswell, Betsy Forrest of Rare.us, and Casey Given of Young Voices Advocates. Our first topic today is the ongoing situation involving Russia and Ukraine. Russia annexed Crimea this week over the protests of America and the West. President Obama's options are limited, and countries like China, Iran, and North Korea are surely watching closely how the U.S. reacts to Russian aggression. Lacey Crawford, what does this episode portend for U.S. foreign policy over the rest of Obama's term? Well, thank you for having me on, John. Uh, I think the Obama administration is definitely going to have to deal with this for the remainder of his term. Uh, right now, I like what Secretary Kerry and um, President Obama are doing. They're trying to use all the levers of America's soft power to compel Russia to come to the table. we got to be very careful, careful the way we deal with Russia because I believe they're the solution or they can help us solve um, the situations in Syria and Iran. So we got to be really careful the way we do this. But uh, a couple days ago, the president signed an executive order where he had sanctions against some officials in Russia. Now, I don't really think that's going to do a lot, but it's going to get the ball rolling. I'd like to thank Public Square for having me. I'm pleased to be here. Crimea borders Russia. Uh, Crimea was considered part of Russia for hundreds of years. The majority of the population of Crimea speak Russian. Russia has a naval base in Crimea. The United States is thousands of miles away on the other side of the world with no real historical or cultural ties to Crimea. I don't really think it's any of our business, and I believe that the more we avoid foreign entanglements, the better it will be for the American people. And for the United States to lecture foreign countries about being come entangled in foreign affairs is really quite ironic. Casey? Um, well, I think that um, while it's certainly true that, uh, as we've seen over the past few decades, that foreign interventionism has really been a detriment to the United States as far as uh, both the cost of lives and the cost of uh, the financial cost as well, it's still important to take a stand against um, against Putin's aggression. This is clearly clearly was an act of aggression in Crimea. Their referendum, their so-called democratic referendum, was a farce where there was no international observers allowed. Um, uh, were allowed. The only two choices presented were to either join Russia now or join Russia later. So I think that actually, um, which is funny for me to say as a libertarian, but I think that the Obama administration has done a fairly good job in handling the situation by enacting economic, uh, limited an- economic sanctions um, and condemning and pode- condemning Putin's aggression while still not um, uh, not going so far as to um, be aggressive in, in any sort of intervention interventionist means. I think we've seen um, already today that um, the stocks in in Moscow have already responded to the economic sanctions. And hopefully with Ukraine, um, or Ukraine joining the European Union soon, um, the, the Crimea and f- hopefully future, future Soviet satellites will see, former Soviet satellites will see that their entanglement with Russia is just not, not the way for any, um, for any 21st century uh, nation state to move forward. Yeah, I agree with a lot of what Casey just said, and thank you for having me on. Um, It's definitely a sticky situation, and you can't exactly say that the vote was perfectly democratic. There was a lot of problems, I think, with that. Um, I agree with you that it will probably consume the rest of the Obama administration's term, and you won't have a lot of... I think that this is going to be a big thing. I think that there's a lot of criticism to be made that Obama has been weak with foreign policy for his entire term, and that that kind of plays into this, how much leverage does he have internationally, how much 
can he actually do? What do these economic sanctions mean? I mean, after the first round of sanctions, people in Russia were saying that this is this is pretty weak. This isn't really all that big of a deal. Russia's threatened to um, dump all of their U.S. securities. That's actually been a problem during the last um, during the financial crisis. Russia actually pressured China into dumping their securities. So I think that there's a lot more going on than we really realize. Um, I'm not advocating by any means that we use force because you know America is absolutely war weary. I think economic sanctions are probably our best bet at this point, but um, I think Obama has been probably pretty weak on the international scale, and I think this Russia entanglement is indicative of that. All right. Before we get to our next topic, I'd like to remind our audience that you can submit your questions to our guests through our website, www.publicsquare.net, and we'll answer as many as we can on air toward the end of the program. This week, the Common Core National Education Standards continue to hit roadblocks after initial adoption by 45 states. Several states are now slowing down, stopping, or even reversing the implementation of the standards. Bill Gates, a Common Core supporter, said this week it's because of misinformation being spread by opponents. Casey Given, what exactly are the standards running into trouble? Well, the standards are running up to trouble for a number of reasons. First, to kind of back up to um, the viewers out there who are unfamiliar with Common Core, um, the Common Core state standards are a new national education standards uh, push um, by the National Governors Association that was first in initially drafted in 2009 and um, over the past few years have been, have been started to be implemented by different states. Um, 45 states have um, formally agreed to the standards, the only five exceptions being Virginia, Texas, Nebraska, Minnesota, and Alaska. Um, and and um, they've run into quite a few a few number of criticisms over the past few years because um, a lot of people, both interestingly on the right and on the left, have worried about federal entanglement in Common Core. So Common Core was first initially adopted as part of a as part of um, Race to the Top back in 2010. The Obama administration basically incentivized states with 4.35 um, billion dollars of grant of grants and through Race to the Top to adopt Common Core, and um, since then has been kind of has been kind of in, has been um, reaching its hand and kind of. Uh, and, and kind of uh, influencing the way that the testing consortia and the tests are being drafted through their federal oversight through the states agreeing to agreeing to Common Core. So there's been a lot of controversy on both sides about whether this federal entanglement is healthy. Um, a lot of critics, um, a lot of critics point to f federal failures like No Child Left Behind, and even before that, under the Clinton administration, Goals 2000, as being uh, a truly dem demonstrative of the failure of federal intervention in federal intervention in, in um, education. So there's been a lot of concern over the past um, few weeks, both on the right and left. Even, even um, uh, of course, a lot of Tea Party interests, interests are against Common Core, but even a lot of um, left pundits like D Diane Ravitch are against Common Core as well because of the federal entanglement. So a number of states have started to push back, um, specifically states like Pennsylvania, Florida, Indiana, Alabama, are looking into options to pausing implementation of Common Core or, or um, p potentially even reversing or, or ending implementation altogether. So it'll be very interesting to see, to see um, in the future how this develops. My personal opinion, I think that um, the federal government's kind of entanglement in the process through, through Race to the Top is really kind of uh, is really kind of concerning, especially considering its its past failure of decades of very um, top down, one size fits all interventions on the state. So I think that this um, pushback is in, among the states is actually quite a a healthy assertion of federalism. I'll keep it on this side of the table, Betsy. Yeah, I would agree with a lot of what Casey just said. My mom is a teacher, and I see her having to deal with all these common core standards and. Um, I think that there's a place for standards and holding people accountable, holding teachers accountable. I am very wary that a national standard, one size fits all method, is the right approach because you know every classroom is different, every student is different. There's different teachers, there's different you know maturity levels among students, especially at a young age. And I think that this kind of approach, and a lot of it is very different. I mean, you see stories every day of math problems that you know engineers don't understand the approach that that they're teaching these students, PhDs. People with PhDs do not understand what this kind of new math process they're teaching people. And so um, I think there's a lot to be critical of, and I think that a, a one-size-fits-all national standard is not 
the proper answer. I think that there's accountability is important, but the one size fits all standard is not the way to do it. Jason? Well, the common core standards are really just basic literary and mathematical standards. I think there tends to be a tendency, a kind of reaction, a kind of knee jerk, almost hysterical reaction to federal initiatives where regardless of the content or the facts about the initiative. I think the people who formulated Common Core, including Bill Gates, are probably pretty shocked about the opposition to what is really basically fairly standard standard educational testing. So I think there tends to be a kind of a knee-jerk, almost hysterical reaction to any federal initiative, regardless of the content of it. And I think when it was originally formulated, most people who formulated the Common Core standards firmly believed it was a bipartisan effort, and I think it should be bipartisan. Lacey. Well, I agree with pretty much everything everyone said. Uh, I'm of two minds uh, with this. Uh, I think it's a good idea to, you know, have a common standard throughout the nation. So, like, when kids are, are moving from state to state. I grew up in North Carolina. Let's say I moved to Virginia. Um, I don't want to be held back a year because I'm not up to literary standards in another state. So I can see, see the trouble um, that people are trying to, to, to change the way America's uh, education system uh, is laid out right now. So I understand the impetus for Common Core, but having a one-size-fits-all ap approach, that can be kind of iffy for a, a lot of reasons, and one in particular, you don't want to just have a, say, a systemic uh, racism problem. You don't want to have that uh, outsourced to all the states in, in, the, in the union. So, like I said, I'm of two minds of, about it. Okay. Uh, on to our next topic. Catching a lot of attention this week was Nate Silver, who launched 538.com, and he hired science writer Roger, Roger Pielke, a skeptic on the question of climate change. This follows Vox.com's Ezra Klein hiring Brandon Ambrosino, a gay writer who has at times been critical of the LGBT community. Jason Roswald, are either of these hires deserving of the backlash they received? Well, I think there's plenty of room for differing opinions, and that everyone has a right to hire people with differing opinions. I think that we should respect and acknowledge differing opinions without attacking the character and integrity of people who disagree with us. I think it's the free flow of differing ideas that moves society forward. So yes, I do think there's a bit of an overreaction and that there's plenty of room for differing viewpoints. Lacey, keep it on this side. Uh, yes, I agree with uh, Jason. Um, at first blush, uh, I didn't see what the big deal was. I, I believe in climate change. I think it's backed up by the facts. That's, that's just my opinion. And I thought it was okay for Nate Silver to, you know, hire someone of a differing opinion. But it looks like from his first post, um, I can't pronounce the reporter's name, Pilkey. Uh, Pilkey. I Pilkey, I believe. A lot of uh, scientists are, are, are looking at his first post and saying, wow, this is misinformation. The way he handled uh, a lot of these facts isn't correct. So um, I, I do value differing opinions, but at the same time, we don't want people's biases to come into their work because I know Nate Silver is really serious about data-driven uh, journalism. I'm not exactly sure what that means, but I suppose it means uh, let it, letting the data speak for their, themselves. Um, and right now we have someone who let their opinions kind of get into uh, the, the whole debate. Betsy? Um, I was just gonna, I think opinion is almost the trademark of modern journalism and for better or for worse that's just so, sort of the way it is. Um, I think it's totally obviously okay to, to hire people of different opinions, as you said. And I also found it really interesting that you said that you believe the facts back up climate change, even though that's your opinion. I would say agree with that. I also would disagree that any policy has any change on climate change, and there's actually also facts to back that up. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot to be critical of, but at the same time, um, I think it's good to hire people. I, I actually think it's very good to hire people of a diverse opinion and I think it's always good to bring people that disagree with you to the table to always point poke holes brings they everybody brings something to the table Casey uh, yeah I would have to be in complete agreement with everyone here <laughs> at the table um, I'm reminded of um, John Stuart Mill in this type of situation his writings on free speech and on liberty where he talks about um, confronting someone of a differing view 
And he says that um, the beauty of free speech, the beauty of being able to come up to hear another person's argument is that even if you vehemently disagree, you understand what the opposition is and your opinions can be re and you can understand, come with a greater understanding of your opinion of why you disagree if, you, if indeed you do. So I think that um, this overreaction is really kind of uh, ind indicative of, of um, you know, just an, an illiberal, Ill illiberal trend to silence others. Um, at least, even in in the in the private sphere. So I think that um, this, these two uh, these two so called controversial hires are totally overblown. The reaction that has been done, and it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing that we we live in a world. We live in a country where um, private organizations can hire people of differing opinions and have their opinions heard, so others can truly understand, uh, can truly decide if they agree or if they disagree. Gentlemen, any other feedback on the topic? Uh I'm curious with uh, with these two personalities um, in Ambrosino's case. Do you think being a homosexual himself that has a bigger effect than, let's say, Mr. Pialki, who's obviously just another scientist, uh, as as Ambrosino being in, kind of embedded in that community? Is that what's your take as far as that's concerned? Uh, we'll start here, with Betsy. Um, I don't know. I think it's. I think you should always be critical of the movement or the community that you're surrounded in. And obviously you, you know, you, you are a part of that community for a reason. You identify with it. But at the same time, you shouldn't just kind of turn a blind eye to certain aspects. You should always be critical of really the world around you. I think that that's kind of the beauty of freedom. And so I don't really have a problem with him being critical of his own community. And likewise, um, with the guy at... Um, Pilkey? Yeah, um, I think he should be equally as critical of his peers as well. I think criticism is actually a trademark of free society, not um, a detriment. Anybody care to ch chime in? Uh, sure, I'll chime in. I, I think that really, um, I really empathize with these two gentlemen, and that I think that they're really taking a critical approach, a critical attitude towards um, towards kind of mainstream accepted opinions. Um, I can tell you at least. Um, at, at least as a gay man myself, I very much sympathize, sympathize with um, Mr. Ambroso um, because of uh, his critical attitude towards um, the LGBT, LGBT community in certain respects. I think that it's healthy for any, sing for any type of person to have, to have a, a critical attitude of, um, f towards any, tor any sort of I identity they have to to, to themselves again, because of the the concept of of um, free of uh, that I mentioned before of John Stuart Mill of, of free speech of truly understanding what you truly embrace and love about your attitudes and your uh, and your affiliations and what you think that could be different. That is truly the beauty of living in a free society, of living in a civil society, is that we can come together and we can discuss and be critical and, and be critical and look towards a, a, a and look towards a better future. So I I definitely I definitely think that these two hires are, um, are the reaction to them are overblown and that um, possibly they could be doing some very good work in the future. Any yeah. thoughts, Jason or Lacey? Well, I agree with what's been said. I think that nowadays public opinion has changed and that most people feel that everyone is entitled to dignity and respect and civil rights uh, regardless of their personal lives. I will say in regards to climate change that I believe it is true that the majority of the world scientists agree that climate change is real and that human activity, at least in part, is contributing to it. But I do see the value of having opposing viewpoints, and I don't see any reason why those opposing viewpoints shouldn't be respected. Anything that? Yeah, I concur. Uh, you have to have diversity. You know, you can poke holes in other people's theories. You can learn and you can grow from it. So. Might I just add to your climate change comment? The science might be true, but the, pol the policies are not. And I think that there's a lot of, even EPA studies say that any policy that the, UP the U.S., implements will have no zero effect on the climate. Okay. Let's move on to our final topic, the so-called Ban Bossy campaign, which is in full swing, and it's also meeting some resistance. The campaign's founder, Sheryl Sandberg, says calling little girls bossy discourages them from developing leadership skills. Betsy Forrest, what's your take on Ban Bossy? Um, I do think being called bossy is not a complimentary term. <laughs> However, I don't know that it plays into being a leader at all actually telling people what to do is not the same thing as motivating people which is actually what leadership is about and I think if girls want to change the way bossy is portrayed that they need to embrace it and maybe change the definition of bossy 
and say, yeah, I'm proud of being bossy because, you know, I empower people and this is what it means to be bossy, rather than saying, we can't use this term and now we're actually giving it more power because it's such a bad word that, you know, you almost give the word more power by saying that it needs to be banned. Did uh, you experience any negative connotation as um, a young... I mean, I, li- I have brothers, so of course I was called bossy all the time, <laughs> but... Um, I think it's something that you have to kind of like reflect on. That's not obviously a good thing to be called, but why are they saying that? You can't just order people around. You have to, you know, to be a leader is to be empowering. Bossy to be is, is has nothing to do with leadership. I don't think actually. Casey, um, I would I would agree. I think that um, you know to contribute to the <laughs> largely agreement um, panel. I think that um, it's absolutely it's absolutely true. I like the intention behind the campaign. I think that absolutely it's it's a positive thing um, for someone for such a positive um, female figure like Cheryl Sandberg to encourage to encourage um, young women to to um, own up to their to leadership skills and not be afraid because of expected social norms. But I would also say that kind of um, th- this whole notion of a ban of um, it just of stigmatizing the word is really kind of adds a, adds a, neg- a negative component to what should be a, a positive campaign, and I think that's really what a lot of the the conflict has come and and um, and a lot of people pushing back against it. So I think something like owning owning bossy, um, like Betsy said, would be a much more positive campaign while ultimately trying to achieve the same social outcome. Jason, well, I'm sure the organizers of this campaign have good intentions. It is a little bit worrisome when I see trying to eliminate words or not speak words from the English language. I think it's kind of a trend towards censorship. But I do believe that the, uh, the intentions behind this campaign are most likely positive. And Lacey? Oh, no, I agree again. <laughs> um, uh, okay, so bossy uh, is a word that some people can see as very you know, derogatory, I guess. But I know a lot of girls that... When, when I was growing up, they were called bossy, and they're leaders now. So, again, uh, I think it's good that they're trying to empower women, m- empower young girls so that they can become leaders. I just don't know if this is the right avenue to do it. Now, some words I think should be banned, but that's that's me, but bossy. That's it, yeah. That's <laughs> nitpicking? I almost think that owning bad words is a like, good way to be empowering and make you a stronger leader rather than saying... Like, if someone were to call me bossy today, I would be proud of the fact that, you know, I have the ability to tell people what to do as a leader. But, you know, to ban the word completely is just, yeah, yeah not exactly the right... But if you were to hear that in a, I guess, a non-work setting, if someone said, oh, she's kind of bossy. Would, I, I mean, the thing is, as I go back to my criticism comment, I think there's always room for criticism. If someone wants to criticize my personality, there's probably a place for that. So maybe I was being bossy, maybe it was inappropriate, but... You know, I just think that, being, yeah, as you said, banning words is generally not the right take on this. But the to encourage girls to be leaders and to own that is absolutely a very positive um, goal and campaign. I don't know that banning boss is um, the right tactics. Okay. It is uh, time to take some questions from our viewers. Uh, our first question on tap. Without national education standards, don't states have an incentive to water down their own standards? We'll start with Casey. How about you field this one first? Um, Okay. Won't states have incentive to do? I would say absolutely not. I think to the contrary, that with um, freedom in education, that states have states have more of an incentive to tailor their education, to tailor their standards, and to uh, to more of their students' needs, and to excel in certain and certain things. for example, and I think that's one of that's actually one of the unintended consequences of the Common Core is that we've been seeing that some states, as a result, are actually dumbing down their standards because the Common Core only allows states to add 10% onto the curriculum. So states like Massachusetts, which has for decades been considered um, to have the the best uh, this best education standards in the nation, are now going to be seeing a poor quality because of Common Core. And states like Indiana as well, um, uh, uh, the Fordham Institute. Institute actually has an interesting study about this, um, revealing that many states are actually, uh, their, their um, educational standards are coming down. And to actually um, address the point that you brought, you brought up, um, um, re- you brought up um, just a while ago about, the, about Common Core, is that um, 
is that I think in theory there's really nothing wrong with in in theory having national education standards. Um, it's perfectly fine. I mean, if you look at Common Core in theory of these of of 45 different states coming together to draft up and implement standards by education professional professionals, it seems fine. But what really has happened since then has been a botched implementation. By the way, this is the exact the exact phrase that the National Education Association, the largest teachers union in the nation, has described Common. Common Core, a botched implementation um, through the federal government. Uh, Common Core was adopted just um, by the 45 states in a span of three months after the initial draft was uh, the initial draft came out. This is no, was not a responsible way for education professionals to truly come together, have a discussion, and and create a curriculum that is appropriate for uh, for almost all of the nation's uh, school children to adopt. So I think that to the contrary, um, it would be best to have more of a federalist standards where states can where states can truly be a laboratory of democracy and get the best um, standards possible. Jason? Well, the Common Core standards are pretty basic literary and mathematical standards, and the people who formulated the Common Core standards are really experts in their field, and as I mentioned earlier, are probably pretty shocked about the opposition. And I think many of the problems with the implementation of Common Core comes from the controversy about Common Core rather than the content of Common Core. The controversy generated by Common Core ha in state legislatures or state board of educations is really, I think, mostly responsible for the problems of implementation. Uh, before this issue became controversial, 45 states signed on to it. You had experts in the field who formulated Common Core. Uh, I'm sure Bill Gates is shocked by the opposition to what is, in reality, fairly moderate uh, educational standards. Lacey? Anything yet? Um, well, yeah, I would have to agree with uh, what Jason was saying and just, just add to, to this. I, I, I don't know about the incubators of federalism throughout the states because if we give too much power to the states, um, a lot of kids are, are not going to be able to accomplish some of the things that kids from Massachusetts can accomplish. So I think we do need like a common standard. Uh, common Core tries to do that. It's not be being implemented correctly. Um, so we can, we can change that. We can tweak that. Anything that? Yeah, I take issue with your point that the content doesn't matter because, I mean, as you see daily, the, there are the new math process, that, how they teach you subtraction, or there's, you know, reading lists for, like, you know, third graders that should be on a high school list. I mean, you see these kind of stories daily. So I think the content of Common Core actually is, I think, a large pro part of the problem. I don't think that that's insignificant to... I mean, surely the implementation may be poor, but I think that the content is equally as um, problematic. Well, next response? well, I think a lot of the reaction, as I mentioned earlier, comes from the fact that it's a federal initiative. And there tends to be a kind of knee-jerk reaction to any kind of federal initiative. If there are any problems with the content, of course you can tweak this or that. But I don't think there's anything wrong with the Common Core standards, and I think we should acknowledge that the people who formulated Common Core standards are experts in their field. And before this issue became controversial, it was pretty much bipartisan effort. Our next question, how far would Russia have to go before you'd be willing to go to war? In other words, what is your red line? We'll start here. Well, start start with me. What is my red line? Um, if, if Russia decides to start invading other former Soviet Union countries. I don't think we can necessarily allow that to happen in this day and age. I don't want to see any type of boots on the ground. Jason? Well, I think public opinions consistently show nowadays that the American people are very wary of foreign entanglements and any kind of foreign wars. In regards to a red line, I think an invasion of the United States or an attack upon NATO allies uh, is definitely a red line, but it's important to keep in mind Russia is a nuclear-powered country, and what we'd be talking about here would be a holocaust of huge proportions. So I think it's important to keep that in mind. Casey? Yeah, I would largely agree. I think um, at least my formula for responsible foreign policy is um, only go to war or intervene when uh, when a country truly poses an, poses an eminent an eminent threat with an E to the United States. So I think that that doesn't mean necessarily that um, if Russia starts nuking, bombing America, because I don't think that's ever going to happen. <laughs> but um, if if um, if if um, if for if for example, as you mentioned, uh, there there was an invasion of a NATO country, which contractually by international law, the United States right. would be obligated to to get itself involved in that. Then I think that would be an appropriate time for some sort of intervention. But um, other than that, um, generally war should be a last resort. Right. 
Messi? Yeah, I would agree with um, a lot of what Casey just said and what you said about NATO. Um, I've described a lot of Russia, what uh, Putin's been doing, as he's still playing risk or access <laughs> and allies. He's still on the board trying to get new territory <laughs> while everyone else has sort of walked away. And um, I think that this his actions have really brought to light that, you know, our nation states as we know them are not as um, hard fast as we think they are. But, yeah, I don't think that anyone is eager to be putting boots on the ground, like you said, and I think I think the last resort would be if he invaded a NATO okay. country. Uh, another question here on Russia. Does anyone expect U.S. sanctions to cause Putin to pull out of Crimea? If not, then what's the point of the sanctions? We'll start on this side with uh, Betsy. Um, I think the sanctions are just economic hurt, and you've already seen this a lot. There's been businesses that have seen a lot of serious consequences as a result of this, so maybe their own um, military ambitions are kind of a sanction of them their, themselves. Um, I think economic hurt can really dry out a lot of um, kind of military ambitions that Russia has. Casey? Um, yeah, I would agree. I, I would say, though, in, in the long term, I don't, to answer the, the, the question with a direct yes or no, no, I don't think that this would act, will have some sort of long-term effect on Russia deciding to pull out of uh, pull out of Crimea. I think what will have an uh, what will have a, a bigger effect if um, if we ever if there is hope for for a democratic for an independent Crimea in the future is really what we're going to be seeing um, in, in the long term. So just this week, the U or Ukraine um, is in final negotiations with joining the European Union, which was kind of uh, the motivation behind oust ousting their prime minister. And while Crimea is essentially getting annexed um, by by Russia, so I think over the next few decades we're going to see a big contrast in kind of a, a Western, more liberal democracy emerging, and light and um, most definitely more economic uh, growth as a result. Whereas Crimea, with more of a command and control economy, will probably be more sluggish. So I think that the contrast in the future in economic systems, of course, they're both mixed economies, but one more freer and one and one less free. If anything, that will be that will be tr will be a motivating factor for a truly free Crimea. Lacey, your thoughts on the sanctions? Uh, yeah, I don't think the san sanctions are really going to do much to hurt Russia, but. Uh, if the EU were able to put sanctions on Russia, I think then we'll be able to get the Russians to come to the table more so because they have, you know, more of a trade relation with, with Russia. Yeah, I don't think these sanctions are going to do much about a Russian foreign policy in regards to Crimea and uh, eastern Ukraine. Uh, the problem with sanctions is in the past, oftentimes they end up hurting the working people of foreign countries rather than the leaders who they're originally targeted to. So I don't think they're going to really have much effect. This situation uh, with Russia and Crimea, of course, uh, goes back hundreds of years, as I mentioned before. Um, most of the people in Crimea speak Russian. It was part of Russia for hundreds of years. It borders Russia. So I really don't think that this is about America. This would be going on regardless of who was president, whether Mitt Romney was president, Hillary Clinton was president. The situation would be more or less the same. And so I don't think these sanctions are going to have any effect at all, except they may hurt the common working people of Russia. And also the uh, sanctions' negative impact go both ways. The uh, world economy is still quite precarious. And uh, these sanctions could have a backfired effect, a uh, negative effect on a uh, European economy and our own economy. So I think we need to be very careful with these sanctions. Okay, it is time for our most underreported story of the week. I uh, believe everybody has brought a story to the table. Well, let's start with Casey. Certainly. Um, so I think the most underreported uh, story of the week is um, actually happened just today. Um, in that um, twenty thousand two, excuse me, two hundred thousand dollars worth of bitcoins, which is a cryptocurrency that has really kind of been a, a huge fad and getting a lot of attention over the over the past few years, has um, has been recovered from a, what was a lost exchange, a bitcoin exchange called Mount Gox. So this um, just last month, um, the the. Uh, just last month, Bitcoin's largest exchange, its website where people can purchase, can purchase, invest in Bitcoin, um, filed for bankruptcy. Um, millions of dollars worth of Bitcoin suddenly disappeared, and it really kind of caused a rift in the in the media, um, where there was a lot of pundits wondering: Is this the de the death of cryptocurrency? Is it um, not safe? Not a comparable uh, monetary? Uh, means of uh, currency compared to government, you know, uh, old-fashioned greenbacks. 
So um, the fact that this was recovered really kind of um, is a new kind of twist in the plot and it's really going to be interesting over the next few months to see that if there's going to be more recovery, how the cryptocurrency community is going to respond to that and just in general how cryptocurrency um, develops in the future as a means of as a means of funds but also um, as a means of, as a, of being able to sustain itself securely um, and not face any government roadblocks. So I think that's the most interesting underreported story of the week. Okay, Lacey, how about you next with your yes, underreported story of the week? Reported story of the week. Uh, our coalition, uh, the Strength and Social Security Coalition, uh, along with Medicare Rights Center, uh, released 150,000 petition signatures against Medicare cuts. Um, and my coalition, very progressive, we believe that through our petition deliveries, through our telepresses, through a lot of protests that we got uh, President Obama to drop the chain CPI, which is a Social Security benefit cut out of his budget. So we're hoping to do the same thing here uh, with Medicare, Medicare cuts and uh, with his means testing that was in, in his budget uh, this past year. Okay, I think we're going to have to <laughs> cut off the comments on that one, but uh, we still have a couple uh, underreported stories. Jason, why don't we go with you in your turn here? Well, it was revealed recently that America's intelligence agencies have the capability to retrieve phone calls from the past from individuals not previously under investigation. This is just further evidence that American intelligence community is conducting warrantless wiretapping without probable cause and is behaving in a way that is unconstitutional, seems to be beyond the law, and seems to be a real threat to the American Republic. Okay. Bessie? Last one up, what is your underreported story of the week? So in Kansas this week, a anonymous bill was proposed to make it illegal, or no, it's to, um, you know, you can file complaints with the police if something goes wrong, and if a board finds your complaint false, that is now, in, the b bill would propose it to be um, an arrestable offense. So there's a lot of implications with this. It basically means you can't um, you can't ever go against what the police says. If there was an arrest that was seems made that was seemed made out of order, um, you bring it to this board. The board could say it's false. Now you're under arrest. You can't make a complaint anonymously. And um, last year, a hundred a hundred race claims were made, and a hundred of them were all declared as false. So if you ever think that you're being under arrest for any sort of racial reason, this new bill would say that... Doesn't you know, matter. Yes, yeah, it doesn't matter. Now you're under arrest, for, and you can't make this claim anonymously. So I find that very troublesome. I don't know that it will go anywhere. I find it also ironic that the bill was proposed anonymously, given that, like, the... That was the whole point. <laughs> and on, like, you know, <laughs> anti-anonymity within the bill. I find it very troublesome, though. And another example of kind of police forces sort of thinking that they are kind of sort of paramilitary entities and able to sort of just run the show. All right, that's <laughs> going to do it for us this week. We appreciate you watching The Square Circle, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>